Okay, so listen, uh, there's been problems out there in the world, and it's called political correctness. <laughs> and the man who, who ha is the expert on political correctness is this man right here. His name is Robert Bobby Slayton. Hello, Bobby. Hello, Alex. How are you? You know, I woke up this morning, went to the park with my girlfriend. I, have, I didn't even do my hair or my makeup, but compared to you, I guess I look pretty good. Well, yeah, uh, I, I, yeah. I, I had to put the hat on quickly. Notice it says 1939. That was the year I was born. God, wow. God, isn't that horrible? Anyway, um, how, how you doing, Bobby? I'm doing good. You know, when you called me this morning, you wanted to talk about all this crap going on with comedy and I'm... I'm getting kind of tired of talking about it because, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I I haven't been working a lot uh, by my own volition. I, I don't really want to do stand up too much anymore. But you know, the comedy clubs aren't really hiring me much anymore. Uh, some of them aren't paying enough, and I just haven't made it to that big, you know, uh, Carnegie Hall, Radio City level of comedy. So, you know. The, the comedy today, I, you know, you can ask me about the political correctness, what's going on today, and it's, I don't know, I, I don't know what to say. It's, I, I think there's still a lot of people out there. I played a great club in Denver last week, the Comedy Works. I'm going back to the Punchline in San Francisco in a few weeks. And, you know, you got people out there. I don't know if it's the millennials. I don't know if it's, I don't want to blame any specific group of people, the Me Too movement, but people are more on edge than ever. But I think at the same time, there's also a tremendous group of people who still want to see comedy. And they understand it's one of the last bastions of free speech in this country where you can get away with whatever you want and say stuff. Obviously, you can't do it on podcasts anymore because that Shane guy just got kicked off SNL. Mm -hmm. You can't do it on terrestrial radio. You can't do it on satellite radio. Everybody, there's always watchdog groups and there's always, there's always people who are these arbiters of what is correct, what's not correct, what you can well, say. Some, what you can somebody, somebody put it best when they said that uh, if you consider laughter, the uh, you know the greatest uh, form of uh, of of, of uh, medicine, medicine, healing? medicine uh, yeah. that really they're not allowing you to write the prescription anymore. Well, you know, but I, I think like I was going to say, uh, I'm not performing as much as I used to. But when I play some of these great clubs and and and, and a few theaters, I find that when people come out to see you specifically, they know what they're in for. Mm -hmm. And I also find some people they find it refreshing. Because everybody's so stifled, not just not really on comedy stages or radio or television compared to in the workplace. I think people are afraid. And I didn't say this many years ago. People are afraid to tell dirty jokes by the water cooler. I mean, I remember this. This isn't a new thing. It's just more open now and more in the news now, and because of social media and everybody's got a cell phone and a camera. But I remember what was about ten years ago that some guy was talking about at the water cooler at work. Uh, the episode of Seinfeld the night before. Remember the Volva episode? Yeah, right. Uh, and, and, and basically, I mean, that's network television. I don't know how graphic it got, but there was some woman who was offended at the water cooler about talking about a, a TV show from the, you know, the previous evening. So this has been going on for a while. It's just getting a little bit more intense, you know, and I think, I think it kind of started, again, because of all the social media and everybody... You know, it's happened to restaurants with Yelp. It's happened to one or two people can bring down a whole business, it seems, these days. Um, well, here, here's the problem, Bobby, is that, that in these cases, number one, we're going back maybe 10 years, like this guy, is Shane, whatever his name was, that right. got booted from right. SNL. I think that right. that event took place about, what, 10 years ago or something? Did it really? I, I didn't realize how long ago it was. Was yeah. it really that long ago? Well, that's what I was led to believe. It may not have been, but I, I heard 10 years. But we do know that uh, there are a lot of other situations that did go on 10 years ago where people are not working now or being held to account for something they said 10 years ago. And I find that horrible because it reminds me of the McCarthy era when they used to say, oh, back in 1935, were you a member of the Communist right, Party? exactly. It happened to Biden. It happened to a lot of politicians. You know, they changed their... Their, their tone, they change their opinion on something. Uh, well, I did that five, ten years ago. I did it 20 years ago. You know, I've, I've changed. And people, yeah, not just in comedy, he, here, here, acting, here, you know. Here's my main question to you, because I know your act, not by heart any longer, but I used to know it by heart. Uh, a lot of new material, though. Uh, yeah, you got a lot of new material. Uh, we know that, but that's not the point. The that's point right. that I'm that I'm making here is, do you find now that when you do work and you are on stage, 
you've started to censor yourself as to what material you use? Absolutely not. And because I never felt what I did to be really racist or sexist. I mean, yes, there were racial and sexist overtones and some of the jokes, you know, I do like to walk the line, push the boundaries like that guy Shane said, or you do want to shake people up a little bit. But the basic idea of my jokes was, I think that's really funny. That's going to offend somebody. I don't care, but I find it funny. When I was looking at some of those jokes that that guy Shane did about, about the Asians, they weren't particularly funny. They were really nasty. But nasty and funny can go hand in hand. It goes back. To but you time. used to do. You used to do really tons of Chinese stuff. I mean, part of your act was about the Chinese. Well, you know, that's because when I moved to San Francisco, oh, well over forty years ago, you know, I was one of the first guys to do Asian driver jokes. And, you know, I go on the road and I try to joke in Columbus, Ohio, but there really weren't that many Asian drivers. Now, I had about a couple of months ago, I was playing in Atlanta, Georgia. I was in some little town outside of Atlanta. I had some of the best Thai food I ever had because everybody's everywhere now. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, immigrants have moved everywhere. Everybody's got Netflix. Everybody's got cable. That's why American comedians do so well overseas, because everybody sees everything everywhere. But back then, I would do the Asian driver jokes because I was living downtown San Francisco. And I said, these were people really terrible drivers. But on top of all that, um, you know, there was another thing going on back then. I remember there was a club doing a black comedy night in Oakland, and which was fine. And then because the whole gay movement was starting basically in San Francisco in the 70s, early 80s, there was a gay comedy night. And gay people would make fun of straight people and black people would make fun of white people. And I said, well, if they can make fun of me, I can make fun of them. And I understand they were pushing back and I understand all the white privilege crap. There's a whole other conversation. But people found it very offensive and it was a double standard. Wait, you can make a joke about whitey, but I can't make a joke about I used people. to use, say this about uh, Chris Rock. Chris Rock's right. act was 90%, hey, so white people are this and white people are that. Right. Now, if I did that about black people on stage, I'd never work again. But Chris Rock also started making fun of black people a lot, too. And, you, know, you know, niggas like to do this. Niggas like to, by the way, I'm not going to say the N-word. But Chris Rock, <laughs> you he just got a lot did. of bad from the black. No, yeah. You really know the N-word, the C-word? Really, yeah. word, we can do all the consonants and play Jeopardy here? Okay. Yeah. So C-word's cunt, black one's nigger, R is retard. Uh, D is dyke, you know, so, so, almost every consonant has been taken. I stick with the vowels, A, E, I, O, U, sometimes Y, depending on the situation. But I think it was, the, wasn't it Chappelle in his latest, uh, Chappelle in his latest uh, 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 Netflix bus. special no. said that uh, the gays have used up every uh, piece of the alphabet. We can't use any of it anymore, you know. Right, right. I, I was doing that joke a long time ago. Now, Dave's without that any ticket, but it's, it's true. Everybody yeah. has a different... Uh, I got in trouble, not in trouble, but in San Francisco, a few, I think it was last year, I, I did a joke and it wasn't, I, I, I never knew the word dyke was offensive. No, it and isn't, but wait a minute, I've asked lesbians and they say the word dyke is not a negative term. Uh, I've talked to them too, but in the old days, when I was in San Francisco, and I would mention, uh, talking about gay people and dykes, I never had any, any problem, but in San Francisco last year, I said... Uh, you know, I'd point out people, oh, what are you guys from out of town? I have an older couple here, some honeymooners, newlyweds. Hey, we're going to bet you a party, come with dykes at this table. And the woman went ballistic because to her, I guess the D word, and she wanted to yelp or something. The D word is like the N word or the C word, so that's another word. You know something? Yeah. That's strange because, I, and I'm going to say it again. I was told, this was back when I was in San Francisco by some lesbians. I said, right. I don't use the word dyke because I think it's a pejorative term. And they said, right. no, it's not. It's an I okay thought, term. Well, I guess it depends on... Um, it, the person who's sitting at the table in the front row. That's what it depends I thought, on. I found unless you're an English guy drinking a beer in a pub, the word cunt is not usually a good word. Um, you know, a bloody cunt is okay if you're sitting with another guy. And, uh, well, no, but I, I asked, uh, what was his name, the guy who did uh, Live Aid? Uh, 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 Bob Geldof? Bob Geldof. I had him on the show. And, in fact, I even have a, a, a uh, he did a little uh, voice voicer for me so I could use it in a promo on the air at Sirius. And I said, the word cunt, I said, I hear it applied in England more to other guys right. than I ever hear it being applied right. to women. And he right. said, yeah, we, we, the word cunt in England is just a, you're a cunt, you know? Right. And so he made a promo that said, Alex Bennett's Bob Geldof, and I just want to say you're a real cunt. 
Well, you that's know. why that's why I never wanted to, you know, I moved to England because if I moved there with my wife and I was mad at her, what do I call her? I don't know what to say, you know? Yeah. What do you call her when you're mad at him in England? Yeah. There's got to be a word that uh, you should have asked him that. I'll have to call some of my English friends and ask him. Yeah. But, but anyway, um, so yeah, I found that basically, getting back to what you were saying, that, you know, I find that when you play a comedy club, I think a lot of people that come to see you and they know they're in a club, and some, sometimes they even put a warning out. Bobby Slayton is offensive, and which I find to be kind of silly. You find that offensive. But, <laughs> you know, they, they put out there so when people go, you, you know, it is actually interesting. Uh, it was happened in Denver last year. I was playing the club, and you know, you get a few politically correct people, sensitive people, college people, millennial people, whatever they are. Uh, but the show was going really well. And I always say to the doorman, if anybody walks out there at my show, ask them why. I like to know what I did to piss them off. And generally, there's a half a dozen walkouts. And sometimes it's because they got to get home to a babysitter or they're not feeling well or they didn't know the show was running so late or whatever. You know, the old days, we couldn't take the smoke in the club. But I always wonder why somebody's leaving uh, because people do get offended. But I was playing Denver last year and the show went fine. And they told me in the middle of the show that two women walked out crying and I wasn't even talking to them. I made women cry, you know, when they're in the front row, if we're having a little problem, not on purpose, but if they're heckling me, I made them cry. But people in the back of the room that I'm not even talking to directly, I made them cry. And I'm thinking, wow, that's how good I'm getting. <laughs> wow. I could make people cry not even having a conversation with me. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm glad I still have that magic touch. But you know what? I never went out of my way to upset people. And then, um, and by the way, by the way, you do, you don't want to make them cry because if you make them cry, you lose the audience. Right, but they were in the back. No, I, but you look. I've stepped over the line many times. But again, if you walk the line, or whatever you want to call it, working without a net, or you're talking off the top of your head, yeah. or you're in a bad mood, or somebody's heckling you. I've said many things that I go, I shouldn't have said that. I went too far. But, you know, in all the years I've done stand-up, I like to think that the good shows and the great shows have certainly outweighed the few mistakes I've made on stage, you know. Could a guy like Rickles get away with his material today? It's interesting because when I talked to you earlier before we did this, I was thinking about that. You know, Rickles was a product of his time. And I, I, I saw him a couple of years before he died, and he was still great. But, yeah. you know, he was still doing that... Asian caricature he did from probably the Korean War, maybe World War II. Oh, Germany got the back. Oh, you know, yeah. the black guy goes, hey, you know, doing that whole Uncle Tom, yeah. hey, the black guy, <laughs> what's yeah. You know, can that, first of all, I don't know if Don came along today, if that's what he would be doing, if that stuff would work. But it's like looking at Lenny Bruce's stuff. You know, we both love Lenny. We both yeah. appreciate Lenny. Lenny was a genius. But if you look at a lot of the stuff today, would it be shocking? Would it be funny? Um, you know, I, and I think these guys would have changed and adapted. Well, I don't think I don't think Lenny today, if he did the same exact material, would be as shocking or as out there compared to anybody else. I mean, you look at a guy like Chappelle, or look at a guy like Bobby Slayton. You're, I've, I saw Lenny Bruce work. In fact, I, right. the first time I ever saw people walk out on somebody. Right, and, and you got and, to remember that if Lenny Bruce came along today, or. A lot of these guys came along today. Um, when you look at a guy like Dave Chappelle, you look at a guy like Bill Burr, you look at a million comics, they might not be here if it wasn't for, you know, Lenny Bruce and George Carlin and Richard Pryor and even Eddie Murphy. And, but what they did, well, what they did was they yeah. raised they raised the bar, okay? Right. In other words, and they lowered the expectations of what was proper. But uh, today, I would say that if Lenny Bruce were doing the same material that he did then, and he were up against a Dave Chappelle, they would say Dave Chappelle was the more edgy of the comedians. Yeah, but it's hard to say that kind of stuff because, yeah. again, they're a product of the times. And everything was different back then. You know, it's like, I remember I was playing Caesars Tahoe when you, they had a comedy club up there. Me and another comedian went to the main room, it's probably back in the 70s or 80s, to see Red Skelton. And Red was doing Clumpy Little Hopper, and he was doing all that stuff, and I find None of it funny. I, 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 my friend found none of it funny. And the audience was laughing because they grew up with Rex Skelton. You know, a lot of that stuff is dated. It's not funny anymore mm -hmm. if, you, if, if you watch it. But if you grew up with it, then again, Charlie Chaplin, the Marx Brothers, you know, the Honeymooners, still funny. You know, I, I think a lot of stuff, it depends, you know, if, if you're from that era, if you grew up with it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's... So you're, I mean, you're, you're not in any way adapting your material. 
No. To, to, to the sensitivities of now. You would still do the same giant Chinese routines, or would they be dated? Well, I'm playing the San Francisco Punchline in a few weeks. And yeah. I, you know, now I talk about this, that I did all this stuff, but I still do some Asian jokes. I, I have Asian jokes in my head. I still have gay jokes in my head. What bothers me now is because of, I think when I'm watching, not just Trump, I'm not going to blame him or the white supremacists or the right wing or all these people that anti-immigration. There's so much hatred and sexism and racism out there. When I see it, all I'm thinking is, hey, they're taking my act. I did this first. <laughs> Everybody's stealing my show. Everybody's getting pressed by me. All these white supremacists, are, they're running people over. Trump is exciting riots. I did this for years. <laughs> you, you, you yell at the TV screen, that's my material? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's, everybody's stealing my yeah, But you know, the you thing know. is, Bobby, there's something to be said, and I've often mentioned this, about intent. You know, you whenever people watched you perform, nobody felt you hated anybody. But oh, that you were just... Not, not, that you were, most but, people. But, but, the, some. but that you were making fun of everybody. Right. You know, you were an equal opportunity offender. And right. I and I think that, that that counts for something. Intent is is very important to the way in which you say the joke, the way you present it, the way you go after the people in the joke. Right. And your stuff was just so relentless that you made Chinese people funny. Because let's face it, there's something funny about Chinese people. There's something funny about Jewish people. There's something funny about Italian people. Right. Uh, and. Uh, we in this country at one time, you know, vaudeville was filled with dialect comics and right. people who would make fun actually of their own people. All right. I mean, yeah. st look at Step and Fetch It. I mean, the, right. he was a brilliant comic. And the right. reason he consi got considered to be a stereotype wasn't because he set the stereotype, because all the other people that came along and tried to imitate him created the stereotype. Right. Well, Eddie, but, you know, Rochester on the Jack Benny show or. Uh, well, Rochester was different. Rochester on the Benny show, because Benny was a very liberal person, was right. never portrayed really. He was the servant, but he was never kind of portrayed as the servant. Right. He was the observer of this asshole. Right. Okay. And then he was always commenting on it, and the joke was always pulled on Benny. Uh, right. So Rochester was, was different in that respect. Well, you know, the vaudeville, you know, because if you could see old kinescopes and listen to old, um, you know, recordings of the, the Yiddish theater and, and, and vaudeville, and, you know, is some really interesting, very, I can't even do blackface anymore. That was my whole opening. <laughs> it's been ruined. It works for Jolson. But the, I try to do let, it. Let's, but, let's just say Bobby Slayton were up for a job at Saturday Night Live. I know that's impossible at your age because it's an ageist program. Yeah, okay, absolutely. but if you were, do you think they could then go back to your material and say we can't hire you because look, look at what you did? You know, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, I never at, at your that. age, you can keep doing it and go fuck you. You know, it's a little late for me to stop. All the, right. uh, my entire history is out there. You know, right. so why kill the goose that you got the golden egg? Right. Well, like I said, I'm not working that much anymore. I'm happily semi-retired. So, you know, there's nobody can really hurt but me. But wait a minute. How do you feel? How do you say you're semi-retired? How do you feel about that truly? Because I am retired because the business retired me and there is no radio business out there right. any longer. And uh, I'm upset by that. I would like to be working. How do you, you know, feel about it? I'd like to be working too, and the business kind of retired me. But at the same time, look, you know, I never had that hit TV show. I've done a lot of little shows, a lot of little parts of movies. But if I was playing theaters and traveling around the country or the world, making as much in a night as I was making in a, a month playing some horrible comedy club, you know, I basically got burnt out, you know. Uh, like I said, I'm going to San Francisco in a few weeks, one of the few places I still love to work. And I do one or two morning shows. But, you know, they used to try you around, get up in the morning, do the morning radio, and then do a, a drive time afternoon, good, good, good afternoon, Austin. And they come back and do a show. They get up the next morning and do another show. And, you know, fly coach and the planes get canceled. And, you know, you get some drunk bachelorette party. It's all fine. I got paid very well for this. But after a while, it begins to wear on you. You know, I, I would come home. I had a wife at the time. I was raising my daughter. When my wife was gone, my daughter grew up. 
and then I had a sick dog to take care of. I'm in, I'm out. I got to, you know. So it's like I just like being home in my own house. Um, I wish I could have retired, but you know, again, I'm not fully retired. I'm, I, if you look at my website, BobbySlayton.com, I get a few theaters in Florida in November. I got the comedy club in Rochester, New York in November. I got the punch on. I'm working. Um, and almost as much as I want to, just not making as much as I want to. But what really pisses me off, there's all these clubs that I don't really hear from anymore, and it's not because of the material I do. I don't sell a ton of tickets, and there's a lot of new comedians with Netflix specials that sell more tickets than I do. So it's fine. It's it's not the club's fault. It's not my fault. So, uh, you know, I'm having a good time cleaning out closets, swimming, and playing my drum. Have, you, try, have you tried to get a Netflix special? No, I couldn't care less. You know what the problem is with a Netflix special? What? Is that, first of all, to do one, you have to go around to all these clubs and work on the material. And I'm not getting a lot of work in these clubs. And I don't want to work a lot in these clubs. And then to do an Netflix special, if you watch them, these people are playing beautiful theaters. I guess watch Bill Burr live at the Albert Hall. I'd be a little bit jealous. Brilliant comic. Uh, and, and they're playing big theaters. I don't think I can sell a big theater. So where am I doing this special? You know, in your living room? Say so it's like... And, and, and by, on top of all that, when you write... I got a Netflix special for you right out of that. Bobby Slayton in his living room. And yeah, then you get, get about 20 people in your living room and do your act. Well, what's the name did that? I love her. I can't remember her name. She did that with her parents. And her parents... Uh, um, oh, my God. Um, yeah, it's been done. But, um, yeah, like I said, when you do a Netflix special, then you have to have another hour of new material. And I just don't feel like writing all this new material. I kind of feel... Like almost everything. Yeah, but but you, could, you could you could burn off a lot of the old material. That that's what this a lot. My Showtime special, and I I, I, I when I did that, I got it. has been six seven years ago. Um, um, when I did that special, um, I forgot what it was called. What was it called? Raging Bully. No, that was my CD. I don't even remember what it was called. Yeah. Uh, but when I did, I born to be Bobby, because mm -hmm. I had a tattoo on my back. Yeah. I had the tattoo done. I, I, well, for the opening of the special. But um, when I did that, I was putting off a lot of material that had my first three CDs, and I got dozens of people complaining, oh, he's done a lot of old material. So I burnt off and, and, and did all that stuff. And all the new stuff I seem to come up with is either topical or, you know, other people have done similar well, things. Well, people, people have to realize that when you do a special, like a Netflix special or something like that, that you, you are burning off a lot of material you can't really do again because you go to a club and they've heard, they've heard it already. They want well, new... I remember, I remember what time it was. I, maybe our studio hall or the Johnny Carson show. It, it, I, I did a show, and, you know, you do five minutes of stand-up. And mm -hmm. I went, it was Seattle Improv, and I went on stage and did an hour, and some guy comes signing CDs after the show. The guy comes up to me and says, hey, you're really good, but you did the same material on our studio last week. I did four or five minutes on our studio. I just did an hour. So, so yeah, you, know, you, you certainly can't go back and do that Netflix special. So I don't have the wherewithal or the, the energy or maybe the talent to write do an hour. That's why I watch these guys like Dave Chappelle or Bill Burr or Whitney Cummings. And they just did a special last year. You know, well, there was, there, was a period in your, there was a period in your life, Bobby, where you were working so much that I, many times you would say to me, I just got to get off the road. I can't take this any longer. That he just, you were, you were, you were the epitome of the road comic. Yeah, I don't think okay. anybody, anybody outside of maybe Jay Leno, although he doesn't do as many, you know, do clubs anymore. But I was, the stage time that I had, and it wasn't, yeah, I remember, remember years ago reading this interview with Ellen DeGeneres, and she said, she goes, maybe before she got her talk show, she goes, yeah, you know, I was on the road for like seven years and I was burnt out. Well, I was on the road for 40 fucking years, you know, and really burnt out. And I was on the road five out of six weeks, you know, yeah. and would come home and would feel so bad not seeing my daughter grow up that when I was home, I'd get up every morning at seven o'clock. I would take her to school. I'd make her lunch. I'd pick her up from school. I'd take her to Disneyland. So it was like nonstop. Mm -hmm. Um I mean, that's how it's working I mean it's like the dream of every comic okay that I knew who was on the road because most of them while they were road comics were just road comics because they wanted to get somewhere not right. because they that's how they made their living you made right. your living as a road comic yeah uh, but, know, but but that you you had the same dream they all had I want to get a series so I don't have to leave LA 
Exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and I, you know what? And there were a bunch of pilots that I did that just didn't go. Well, yeah, I thought your best that I that I saw because I had to edit your your demo reel was right. you as the Pink Panther, the voice of the Pink Panther. You know, I'm, I'm writing this book that I'm never going to finish. But yeah. that would have been a great. That was great, and CBS did that, and it would have gone. What, what it was was it was they they did a Roger Rabbit thing in which the Pink Panther was animated, right. but the right. rest of it was just the regular world, and the voice of the Pink Panther was Bobby Slayton. Right. Well, it was funny because it was right after Roger Rabbit, and it was you know animation, and you know they did that before with you know Uncle Remus. They did it before with you know with Sail uh, right. the thing with um, a big Crosby where we were dancing with the mouse and. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's been done before, but uh, been done a lot. But it, it was really well done. And when I went to read for the Pink Panther, the voice, you know, they wanted like a James Bond, David Niven, you know, a Sean Connery kind of suave debonair. And when my when my agent set me up for it, the CBS goes, "Well, we love Bobby, but he's the last voice we would ever imagine for the Pink Panther." So I guess they went through every actor, every voice actor, every major celebrity, every every bus boy, every part-time waiter actor, and they couldn't find the voice of the Pink Panther. So they said, oh, what? Bring Bobby in. What the hell? Bring him in. And they said, my voice was so wrong for this that they gave it to me because it was exactly, you know, against type, and it made it very funny. My it, voice it, 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 was, it was the perfect voice for the Pink Panther. Well, that show would have gone, but they changed, um, uh, Terry Hatcher was in that. They, they changed presidents at CBS and, that happened to me a few times, you know, uh, with pilots. But, you know, the other ones I never started, which was great. I never wanted to be Seinfeld. I was wanted to be Jason Alexander or Michael Richards. I, I go, you know what, that's enough work for me. It's a big enough yeah. paycheck. I don't want my name up there. If the show sucks, it ain't me. I'm just a, I'm just a guy helping out. You know, I'm the guy next door, the crazy guy downstairs, I'm the wacky uncle. But, um, <laughs> I, I've done enough of those pilots. They just never went. What can I tell you? Wow. You know, it's, wow. So, uh, so seeing yourself in this in this period of time now, where you're semi-retired, uh, does that bother? You? Does it bother you at all? I mean, really, is there yeah. something in you that really, yeah. you know? But you know what? A lot of it is. Again, it's you know, I I, I could write a whole new hour, and where am I going with? Well, it? here's like, the thing. Here's right. the thing. I I don't understand ageism in comedy, and here's why I don't understand it. Because it. because yeah. funny is funny. I don't care if you're 90. I don't care if you're 10. Funny is funny. But and you don't want to know something? There's a, there's a thing in the comedy clubs now, and I'm not going to tell you who started it because I don't know for sure. One of the major club owners, they don't want comics my age playing the clubs because they're trying to bring in millennials and younger people. When young people see an old guy on stage and old people in the audience, they're not going to go back to this place. They want their own club, their own place. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's true. The reason a guy like Lewis Black or, or if it was a lot of George Carlin or whatever would still be working was because they were playing theaters and they had a giant audience. The comedy clubs now, it, a lot of people my age aren't going to comedy clubs. So that's the problem. Okay, but here, 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 here's the point. You brought up Lewis Black. I was thinking the other day, when's the last time you saw Lewis Black do his act on television? Well, he's on once in a while. He's always popping up on the He's on shows. once in a while, but not like he was. And I think, you know, I think he's one of the best comics alive. I think you're one. Of, I think you are singularly the most classic, best stand-up comic in the business, period. Well, I, I mean, as, I, I, as a I, pure stand-up. There's a lot of guys, a few guys that are better now, but it's fine. I don't need to be the best. No, I mean, but, Chappelle um, is terrific, and Bill Burr is terrific, and all those guys are terrific. But if I wanted to go to just a classic stand-up comic, you're it. You're the epitome of it. Yeah, well, there's a lot of old guys like you that don't leave their apartment and don't come see me. Well. So that's the problem. My friends, my friends are either dead or in Florida. It happened to the Smothered Brothers. I, I remember they were telling me that their audience stopped going to Vegas, you know? Yeah. Merle Griffin's gone. You know, Mrs. Miller is gone. Um, but but David Brenner told me the same thing, that, you know, he went from making 75000 a week to 10000 a week playing comedy clubs, and he wasn't drawing because his fan base was either dead or, moved, like I said, moved, moved away. Or they don't want to be in a comedy club with bachelorettes and people on their cell phones and crappy food and DUIs and no place to park. You know, so the, the days of those big, you know, vacancy showrooms are kind of dying. Um, yeah. And it's the younger crowd that's going on now, which is fine. I get it. Yeah. You know, am I a little angry? No, I don't have time. I got another good 10, 20 years. You know, my girlfriend and I go out for dinner every night, <clears throat> knock off a bottle of wine, 
as soon as I'm finished with your dumb interview, I'm going to go, you know, work out at my gym. I have a, I have a, I have a good time being retired. You have a good life. You've always had a good life, Bobby. You know, I mean, uh, and they've been several different lives, too, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your and, days as being you know, the family man is no longer exists. You're now, you know, back to having a girlfriend and doing that sort of thing. Right. Well, you know, when my wife died, it's been, you know, it's almost four years already. April's going to be four years my wife's gone. And, uh, you know, my girlfriend's husband died five years ago. I told you that story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like she, she lives around the corner from me. I met her at her husband's funeral. I mean, it's an amazing story. <laughs> and, her and I, you know, and then when I see, uh, you know, people I opened up for, Rick Ocasek, I opened for the cars of the old world up in San Francisco. And Eddie Money opened for many, many years. And so I see people all around me, not that much older than me, yeah. dying. Yep. So I think, well, you know what? I can't sit there complaining about fucking showbiz. I'm not going to let that define me. It gets a little depressing, but I'm still working. And you know what? Woody Allen called me last month. I think I told you. He flew me to Spain yeah. to do I did to do two lines in his latest movie, which might not get released here because of all that trouble he had, but um, which I think was bullshit. But that's a whole other conversation. But I'm going. You know what? I'm working. I got a uh, a couple of other things on HBO coming out that I'm not supposed to talk about till the release. So I'm working. Yeah. I'm keeping busy. So it's fine. Yeah, and and uh, well, I think the Woody Allen picture will probably get released here. I mean, it's I think they've already got a distributor here, so. Well, yeah. hopefully, but you know, again, I have two lines in the movie. There's another sad situation. I mean, we could get into that, but you I know, don't want to get into it. That's for another time. I mean, I think what's happened to Woody is is horrid. You yeah. Know. Well, uh, it's, it's from everything I've read and from everybody I've talked to that knows him and <laughs> whatever. You yeah. know, I'm sticking up for him. Um, Maybe that's why I'm not working. Me and Scarlett Johansson, it's over for us. <laughs> Scarlett called me the other day. Bobby, what are we going to do? I don't know what to tell you, man. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I like to carry him, but I got a girlfriend. You know, I can't help you. Hey, listen, so, now, now that we got the Skype working, we should do this more often. I, I just love talking to you, you know? Well, I don't, it's not like I'm busy doing anything else. Um, yeah. You know? And I, I come to New York more often, but my, my free apartment, which I don't want to get into. That's gone now. <laughs> well, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Well, it, it probably he heard your latest comedy and decided to hang himself. So yeah. uh, that's a bit yeah. way we can hint at who that was. Yeah. Uh, but that, that's an amazing. That's another amazing story. But uh, let's uh, let me call you in a couple. Let me write you in a couple weeks or text you and and we'll do this again because it's a perfectly perfect signal now. We last time we tried to do you on Skype. It was like we were looking at the, the moon pictures, you know. At AT and T, now I got Spectrum. Maybe if I give them a plug, they'll give me a few new cable boxes yeah. or something. Anyway, but anyway, yeah, I'll do it anytime you want. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you go to my, you'll see I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm around. Well, listen, stick around after we stop talking here. I just want to say goodbye to you. And right now, we'll say goodbye to Bobby Slayton. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah, I hope I shed some light on this whole problem. You know, it's. It's, it's getting so disappointing. You know, Louis C.K., you, you can't oh, even... Oh, oh, don't even start me on that one, you know. Uh, okay, we'll talk about that another time, but apparently you can't even lock a girl in the hotel room, take off your clothes and jack off. I guess that's out now. <laughs> what am I going to do? There's none of that, no blackface, no wonder I can't do another special. <laughs> Bobby, Sl I Bobby Slayton, ladies and gentlemen. You can all applaud now. Okay, thank you. <laughs>